Okay guys, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. We'll get started more officially here in the next five minutes, waiting for some people to join. At this time, um, I'll just jump into a little bit of a disclaimer. Everything I'm going to share here tonight is uh, just my opinion and not financial advice. My goal here is to, for the next hour at least, purely devote myself to you, to your learning and your education, helping to support you become the best trader possible. Um, if you have any chart requests, you can drop those tickers in the discussion channel throughout the lesson. If you have questions, comments, concerns, etc., please, please, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out politely interrupt me. We use the push to talk feature in Academy, so um, John was kind enough to post those directions in discussion. If you are on mobile or desktop, it might be different, but check out your preferences. Thank you everyone who is joining us tonight. If you are not able to catch it live or if you've got something else to do, I'll go ahead and record it for you. We're already running the recording now. I'll post that in trading resources later. So Griffith, uh, yes, it will be recorded. Though I do encourage people to stay live, the whole reason we do live analysis is because um, I don't want you to have to wait for your requests. We want to see what the trading day brings tomorrow, right? But also I want to, um, if you teach a man to fish, you know, he can feed himself for his whole life instead of me just handing you the fish. So that's the ultimate goal here. All right, Mario, we've got Coop. Add it to the list. Awesome. Um, if you, VK, we will, I have a certain video on fib retracements I can share with you at another time. Um, the structure of this live analysis session is primarily going to be um, step one ticker requests because whatever you guys want to learn and focus on, that's my priority with the time that we have together. And then um, for the remainder of the lesson, I have set up uh, some small mini lessons to reinforce the concepts from yesterday's fundamentals, which is... Um, identifying chart patterns. Primarily I will be showing you um, Finviz tonight, which is a great tool to use as a stock screener, not just for chart patterns, but for sectors, industries, and I'm going to show you my secret sauce of how I select uh, my trades. PayPal added to the list too, Naughty. No problem, no problem. We've got an AMC request in the DMs. All right, guys, I want to go ahead and get started because those of y'all who are here, I know you've already been here, sitting here five or ten minutes. Let's make the most of our time. Um, thanks again to John for helping me in the background. Again, guys, if you have any questions for me, please uh, feel free to interrupt me if you need to. Um, you are also welcome to, if you aren't able to speak, I know some of you have families, work stuff going on, drop those questions in the discussion channel for me as well. Uh, Dusty adding Prague to the list for sure, for sure. Okay. So um, before I start, disclaimer, there's a screen share happening right here. Some people will go through these lessons and just listen to me talk and not be able to see the visuals. I definitely want you to see the visuals. So when you pull up the classroom, the academy session, go ahead and hit watch stream. I am going to pull up the first ticker on the list, which is Upstart. Anytime I'm going to pull up a chart, y'all, I'm going to do two things. First thing I'm going to do is look at it high time frame first because this will help us identify our primary trends. Remember, primary trends are one year long by definition. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a second tab open to finviz.com. This is a free stock screener. You don't have to use it um, or you don't have to pay to use it. And you type in your ticker. And I like this website because it gives you a consolidated, digestible version of all the information in regards to your ticker. I use this to check my bias. I use this to see a few things. First, I'll peek at the chart they have because they usually identify something in a certain time frame that people are trading off of. Next, I'll show you my secret sauce. I'm going to save the secret sauce for the end, the cherry on top, but I'm telling you, once you understand how to pick these stocks, it's 
it's pretty hard not to be profitable, bro. Then when we come down here, we'll see what institutions rate the stock price at. This gives you a good insight into how the trading could be in the future, based on how it was in the past, as, as well as the top news headlines regarding your ticker. So when you jump into chat during the day and you're like, what's happening to Upstart? Why did this happen? A good thing to pull up instead of going to Google and news and trying to sort it is going to the source that sorts sorts it for you. It goes to time, um, importance. If you have your brokerages, like if you use Thinkorswim, this will do that for you as well too. Okay, so let's look at the chart for Upstart. First things first, um, Upstart on the high time frame chart on the daily, we see a primary trend of trending up, right? When you have a trend line, some people use the bodies of the candles and they try and line up the bodies along the way. Other times, other people will use the wicks. If you aren't sure which one to go with, uh, my recommendation to you is always I want to teach you how to fish. So do both and see which one lines up. Once you set a trend line though, try not to move it because what people, some people get in the habit of is they could have seen in this last two weeks Upstart lost its trend and instead of acknowledging the fact in front of them that it lost its trend and it is now changing a trend, they might pull this down to a wick here and say, oh, well, see, it's still going to bounce off the trend line, right? Well, not so sure because the wick isn't a strong part of your candle body, but you also want for a trend line, you want at least three touches. If you use this wick, where is this touching? Nowhere. So when we look at the primary trend for upstart, we see one, two, and then three. That's a trend line right there. So on the daily, Upstart has lost its primary uptrend. Next thing we want to look at is the secondary trend, which is three months. So we count back, it's December, November, October, September. So if we just look at this secondary trend right here, from here to September, what do we see it's happening? Has it spent more time going up or has it spent more time going down? It's pretty uh, pretty fair here, you know, a little bit of upstart, but most of this is consolidation. This is mostly sideways trading, and you have a difference from this swing high here to this low of 60%. So what do I think about upstart and high time frame? It's lost its primary uptrend. It's on a downtrend. So the next step we want to do is we want to determine where we think it's going next. I'm going to remove my drawings, remove my indicators, and I'm going to chart support and resistance. On Upstart, actually, let me do this first. Let me post this. I'm going to post this in discussion real quick. Thanks for your patience as I load the chart, guys. I know that when you're in the lesson, I want you to be able to hear um, about the skills as I'm teaching them, too. I don't want you to be like hurrying and scribbling down numbers or anything. So my primary goal is um, when I share the charts, I want to send them. So if I forget to, go ahead and remind me on that. Cause sometimes I get enthralled and get really into it. Okay, so the next thing we want to do on Upstart, I'm going to remove everything, have a clean slate, no bias. I'm just going to look for some supports and resistances here. Oftentimes, old resistances become supports. If you don't sh if you don't know where resistance was, think about these pe being pegs on a pegboard. Where can you hang a shelf? It's got to have a couple spots for price to rest at. So we see this was a resistance, it burst through, and now it's being tested as a support. Ideally for upstart, this could be a range to buy, but what you have here is a, a gap in price from here to here. If you look on the daily, or if you look at um, other time frames, you'll be able to look closer at that gap if you want to zoom in and get real particular about what the price levels are. But when you're looking at things on the daily, you can pretty much, I just put a rectangle in there, that's my strategy. This is a, a buying area. This support should hold. What we want to see is price to be bought, um, upstart to be bought at this range. So I'd say the lowest I'd want to see it go to be picked up would be 134. That's pretty far away. The next resistance I see, you see these candles over here, these guys over here. I would consider a buy at 147.17, and then I would also consider an entry uh, 156, 165. So could price come down lower? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're playing puts, be careful. Um, the area for invalidation on this, where we think it could break, is this old support and resistance line right here. 
this stock is generally in an uptrend still even though it broke its channel that it was going on we could see it, see it come down here and revisit this price area it's still above a hundred so you never know what could happen but this is a top pattern right here around a top wait until this if you're in a long on this one uh, I know a couple of different people asked about upstart so I can't personalize your trade but if you're in a long like too naughty and um, don't recall who else asked wait to see reversal here by strength not weakness don't try and catch these knives if you're in a long right now look at smaller time frames and you will we'll see that we did get a little bit of buying here the way to check is just to use your volume indicators right what you want to see is more buying than selling buying means price goes up selling means price goes down so I'll post this chart as well for upstart because those levels are kind of important here if you're in a long I'd first take profit at the first resistance here 190 hope that helps you for upstart any questions on upstart before we continue all right next on the list is oh hey go ahead whomever was gonna ask Oh, Time Hawks, Upstart, b Put, Butterfly idea. Um, I'll say this, all the analysts in X-Trades are really incredible, but Time Hawk was um, definitely a personal mentor of mine. I'm a big fan, and um, although I can't speak to specifics of his Put, Butterfly because I haven't looked at it, analyzed it myself, but I will tell you that just off the bat, the fact that it's Time Hawk, I trust it. Um, hopefully you have your own, you've identified your own entries and exit points as well, but... Um, generally, I really value his his plays and his opinions. Next on the list, Ben Light. Happy to add those to the list, my guy. Lucid and Airbnb, for sure, for sure. Let's look at Shop next. Um, Toon Naughty, the good question before we move on Upstart. Upstart Toon Naughty says, how do I know the probability that gap fill on Upstart? Let's look at a smaller time frame. Let's look at it a little closer. So the gap fill here was just price jumped up. What happened was price got to this point where there was a resistance and this turned it into support. So many people saw that and it was also coinciding with earnings, which means crazy price action, okay? Unreliable price action. It could have gone up, it could have gone down, but because the price said a support could go here, that's what made this go up. I don't know if you guys can hear my... um. My cat snoring in the background. Cheddar is snoring like an old man right now. So if, if that's a problem, let me know. I don't want to wake him up though. So, okay. So the probability of the gap fill, you never know. 50-50. Yes, you, um, yes, it could fill. No, it, maybe it won't. But earnings are really uh, volatile times. So sometimes it'll go, but look how long this has ran unchecked. This is why price came back down here. It has, um, it came back to check this zone, boom. Came back to check this zone, boom. It has not come back to check this zone. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We know that that's that primary uptrend, right? So I can't say for sure, too nutty. You're good. So let's go on to... Awesome. Happy it helped you, man. Uh, let's go to shop. Shopify. Shopify on the daily. Oftentimes, a lot of the tickers you guys request, I will have traded too. For the sake of the lesson, I'm going to keep it clean here. Uh, Shopify, we've already had our earnings, so we look good. I'm just checking those because, as I mentioned, earnings are volatile. Next, I want to ask myself, what's the primary trend here? Are we uptrending or are we downtrending? We're definitely uptrending. Next, is there an identifiable trend on the chart? There are a couple. We've got one, two touches here. Maybe we'll have a third. There's another one here. I love Cheddar so much, but he's so loud, bro. Um, these prices right here. Do you see where all these touches are at? So sometimes we have we identify supports and resistances horizontally, but sometimes you're going to see some trends coming out diagonally. If you haven't played with Fib fans and things, that's a cool technique for you as well. Another thing to look at um, can be identifying where these high time frame resistances are, and those higher time frame resistances are the peaks of the trend. And then this low one you can do off of the valleys where the low points are. So this is called an ascending broadening wedge. Um, really just means price is going up and down and up and down but staying within a certain channel. 
looking here on Shopify, you can definitely see some primary resistances. I will chart my supports and resistances, my key levels in blue. And I'm just looking for where those price shelves were. Where was price trying to break through? And where has price held? I'm not going to go too far into the back end of this pattern because I want to look more over here. Let's look at our three month, our secondary trend. We're in December, so we want to go to September 1st-ish. So we've got this bad boy right here. This is what we're looking at for the last three months of price action. What do we see? Has price spent more time going up or has price spent more time going down? If you can believe it, this is actually revisiting the same prices that it was in the last three months. So what is the secondary trend here on uh, on Shop on Shopify? There's it's just consolidating. I mean, price is bouncing. It's trading within a range. What is that range? That is this supply zone here, which is where people feel like they should sell it because they're happy the price went there. We're going to include these candles over here versus this demand zone. Where did people buy this price? They bought it here. How am I identifying these zones? I'm using the top highest candles near resistance areas and the bottom bullish candles where buying started overpower selling to move up and go in there. Let me um, post these charts. Shot. So with Shopify, um, we want to, or with any ticker, we want to trade the range. We want to be buying at demand and selling at supply. In supply, if it doesn't break through resistance, we want to short it. We want to be in puts. So if you're not in Shopify right now, um, it's in the middle of a range. We don't want to trade the middle of the range. We want to go the top or bottom. But you can also see that the confluence here that makes this special, which is why people are asking for this ticker, is because this is at a support line. What you want to ask yourself is how many times has Shopify come to test this support line? It came to test it once, it came to test it twice, and then it came to test it three times. The third time is usually your third time's a charm. It's either going to hold and move up to the next leg and, and have a new trend, or it's going to fail. What did it do? It failed because there was more demand for it at this level, and Price wanted to come back and test these old, flip this old resistance into a support. So now what you've got to ask, it's going for round two. So let's change our color so we can see this. Once it broke through this resistance, it came over here, boom. It said, this is a resistance for me. Let's go with our secondary trend. Can I break through it? It said, nah. <laughs> nah, bro. Then it came to try over here. It didn't get all the way down there. So it's here for a second time. What time is the charm? Third time's the charm. So where do I think Shopify is going to go? I think that um, one of two places, the bullish scenario is that since this support has been tested so many times and price is finally trying to give in and we're close to this edge of the wedge, there's a chance that it could run back up here into the supply zone. That's the bullish short time frame scenario. Next is it wants to come back into demand for a third time. Do you see this? One, two, third time's a charm. Then what's it going to do? Come back up here and test the supply and hopefully break through. When you look at these scenarios, both of these, one of these is short term bearish, but really both of these are going to be longer term bullish. And um, you have confluence here. Confluence means a numer numerous things in your um, list that leads to more probability. So for Shopify, I see the probability of it visiting demand zone. I see that this really wants to be an SR flip. I see that in this ascending broadening wedge pattern, price likes to stay within this range, so it could come down here. But ultimately, where does price want to go? We identified a primary uptrend of, or a primary trend of up. So where does price want to go? Up. So if you're in shop, I play, um, I play calls for the long term, but I wouldn't trade the range here. I'd wait smaller time frame. Let me add. Um, these two are, and uh, paid paid Anel. I've never known how to say your name. You can tell me how to pronounce it. But um, if I get if I lose your questions in the chat from my chart spamming, let me know, guys. Don't be don't uh, feel afraid to tell me twice. So when you're looking here at Shopify, the smaller time frame. Remember, we were looking at which path it's going to take. This looks um, the price looks weak here. 
it's at a support. What you want to see are full bodied candles, strong buying. So you want to look at your volume and see strong green uptrending. We're seeing more selling overpowering buying right now. So for Shopify, for that reason, anybody in shop, I'd say that it's likely that we revisit this demand zone. We might not visit all the way down. Do you see how this one went down here, then this guy here? What we'll probably likely do is swing the mother candle right here. And that's going to be about the halfway point if you've been in my support and resistance lessons. So I'm thinking price will probably come to around 1400 That's a nice benchmark number. And then we'll see that uptrend continue. What you have here on the daily is a spinning top. That means uncertainty, right? So P done. Thank you. P done now? What's the N letter though? Let me know. Okay, so Shopify. That's Shopify. Let's look at SPY. If you follow us in the podcast, um, we go over SPY 24-7, basically JTW's baby, right? SPY has been in this long uh, trend. Sorry, guys, I should have asked before I moved on. Any questions? Any questions on Shopify? I'll keep going. We had the lows here from the 20s, but since this past part of the year, we've had this uptrend going, but it, SPY's been rough, man. I don't know what to make about it. I'm pretty bearish on SPY. If you're playing SPY plans, uh, JTW is your man. Also, like um, I'm a big fan of WAGS' SPY plans. I think that WAGS has um, a solid technical perspective on the market. I think with SPY, we could go a little lower. Do you see, when we talk about confluence and moonshot, I love <laughs> a confluence or confluence, however you want to pronounce it. Um, we've got SPY wanting to come down to this bottom part of the channel or this wedge. And we also have this old support and resistance zone right here. You see where it was resisting here, didn't hold here, resisted here, didn't hold here. So I'm thinking we could see SPY go lower. I don't um, think it will. I, I kind of do think it'll go that low, to be honest. I'm pretty bearish right now. But these are some of my targets for uh, for SPY. What you what is nice though? What you saw today was a big um, some buying action. But uh, if you again heard me on the podcast, I would recommend listening to the recording of that. But I went over bearish um, phases, and I think we're in re one right now. Fridays will usually open pretty strong in the mornings. Then they'll get a little weak. But one sector index or one of the big averages, like the Dow Jones, will finish green to throw the bulls off the scent and not realize the bearish and be like challenging themselves, right? Like, is it really that bearish? So we could lose a little something something here. It's not good in my eyes, not uh, too big of a fan. That's why I'm not trading at the moment. But anytime I'm not trading, what I want to be doing is teaching and giving unbiased objective perspectives. So that's my opinion on SPY at the moment. Um, let's go ahead. Narf, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, when you talk about not knowing enough to benefit yet, just be a sponge, baby. Just be a sponge for as long as you can. And one day, I promise you, it'll click. We'll do some more lessons geared towards beginners as well. Happy to hear some more personalized feedback if you also think I'm uh, doing too much or whatever in the DMs later. Uh, QS, I've added to the list, by the way. We've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Next on the list, Tesla. If you follow my options chat trading, I trade Tesla pretty frequently. It's a stock I'm uh, very familiar with, very bullish on the long run. So the daily trend on Tesla, we're definitely uptrending still. What we have here, though, is um, what we were just talking about with supports and resistances. Let's look incredibly basic here on Tesla. We have here two, um, two, three, four. This was pre previously an area of supply, and down here was an area of demand. When it came back up to test this area of supply for the next time, it broke through. But what does price want to do when it breaks into a new segment? It wants to establish new supply and demand ranges. Unfortunately, we had a massive gap fill here, and this came from movement and price of people buying strongly because there was an ascending um, channel over here that Tesla was in for like, I don't know, six months. And when it broke through, that's what triggered the buying. Okay, so when we talk about those gap fills being filled, uh, yeah, price likes to come and fill those gaps eventually. Um, do they always? No, you can't say with certainty. But with Tesla here, you have a resistance break through here that hasn't been tested as a support. 
What else I'm seeing on Tesla is we're seeing one of the chart patterns that we went over in class this week, and that's a, a bit of a double top action. A double top pattern is when price comes up and it forms a new high, and then it comes up and it, um, and it tries to swing that high, but it can't break through. Right? So what's it going to do? It's going to want to retrace and find a new support. Realistically, some points where Tesla could revisit the 50% of this mother candle right here. Realistically, where is another price t price could visit? It could come to, um, there's a buying range here in this level, 1039, 1040. We'll look at that smaller time frame so I can show you that. But it could come to this gap fill and really, it honestly, could come back down through here. What you have here as a barrier is round numbers, guys. Big numbers, a um, thousand. 500, you know, 750, all of that stuff, those are going to be borders or boundaries for people to say, will it really go that low or is this the new price structure? Well, let's look at our secondary trend and determine that. We have September 1st is our price marking that we're doing for our secondary trends. What trend is happening now? Up or down? Up, baby. So we have a primary trend of up. We have a secondary trend of up. But we have, let's look at the minor trend. Smaller time frames, minor trends are going to be three weeks. Three weeks. So three weeks here, if we pull up our calendar, we're looking into November a little bit. So our trend here, and I'm just using this to show the point of area of candles that I'm looking at, guys, is sort of, it's wanting to come back to the same point that it's at. It ran up a little bit but it's almost retraced. It ran up about 25%, but ultimately price is retraced um, almost 10% maybe it will. So you're looking at about a 15% gainer across the way here. Where do we think price could find a bottom? Where could we find a support? Maybe here, maybe this guy right here, which is what I was pointing out earlier when I was like small time frame, because you see this group of candles here. There's also a demand for it at this price range, but that $1,000, guys, is going to be a kicker. If it breaks 1000 Tesla has this has this tendency to, when it breaks a support, man, it loses, it, it not only loses support from longers, but what it is is people jump into puts because this thing has volatility that can pay out big, big, big. So what you've got going on uh, is... When it falls through those supports, you can lose 10% in a day. We saw that with Tesla already. So if this is that double topping sort of a pattern here, if it loses this support region, if it loses that $1,000 mark, then man, where could it go? Gap fill. Where could it go? This SR flip region. If it does, guys, this is a growth stock for a long-term buying op. All right. If you're sh if you're um, short time frame on Tesla, still watch those regions because those higher time frame regions are going to have a lot more importance than others. For some people, I saw some people today saying that this is a symmetrical triangle. When you have a symmetrical triangle, um, it means it's 50-50 going to go in one direction or the other. What it really is, is it's just another form of price consolidation. Price is choosing where to go up or down and to me it looks like uh, it looks like some downside but when you're making higher lows nobody knows where it's gonna go the method is to measure this 5% and then measure from the breakout of this 5% boom that's gonna be your target look for areas of confluence and I'd adjust it accordingly so I'd say about there then if you think you're gonna break to the downside take it from the peak of the triangle boom 5% the reason I chart the symmetrical triangle later, do you see how the how the targets are different but similar to these areas? Of, that's confluence. You want to have more things going in one direction. So I'll post the uh, small time frame for Tesla, which I'm not thinking it looks hot, but you also have to know that Tesla is just a beast. When people decide it's going to go long, it's going to go long. Uh, learning stocks, thank you so much for the compliment. Uh, OEG, I'm adding to the list. I've got quite a list going on here and I'm going a little in depth into tickers. So I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit just to make sure that we get through everybody's requests because again, my time is here for you, not for me to hear myself talk. So Coop, Coopa Software. What's the primary trend here on the year? Uh, wah, 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 wah. 
not liking it, y'all. Not liking it. We are not making higher highs. In fact, we're making lower lows. That means primary downtrend. What are we looking at the three month scale? Yes, Garav, this is going to be, this is recorded. And thank you for your kind words. So we're looking at our three months here. Let's hit up September. Boom. What We also had earnings in this period. So this is the chunk of time we're looking at Coupa. Coupa, we have a clear, um, what, when you look at this primary downtrend, guys, I don't want you to look at these other things. People thought, here's a multiple bottom scenario. But when you're looking, this is why understanding those trend analysis, like we go over in fundamentals, are so important, right? So what we have here recently, if it's not a double top, it could be considered a triple top. This is why it's important with chart patterns, you want to look for confluence. Confluence is a multitude of factors leaning in categories. If you have um, like a pros and cons list, you know, and you're breaking up, here is the pluses or a long bullish scenario. Here's bearish scenario. And you're starting to tally up the things that look bullish. And you're starting to tally up the things that look bearish. This means probability is on your side with whatever category you go into. Okay. So with Koopa, the probability is on your side that this is a good shorting opportunity. Likely, this person who requested this chart is probably already in some shorts because of the primary trend and the secondary trend being downtrending. But let's see if it's found um, any. I mean, it's not looking cute. Let's check it out. Let me find some semblance of a support here on the daily for you. So what we want to do is find the um, old resistance. And that's going to be where price is going to want to revisit here. So is it almost there? Yep. But it's this is the first and only time this has tested this. So where was the next one? There. Where could the rebound be? There. So this is the range you have to work with on Koopa. If you're short term, um, you're middle of the range. I wouldn't trade it if you're not in it. If you're long, uh, GG, no re. <laughs> uh, if you are short, congratulations. <laughs> enjoy enjoy your steak and lobster f filet mignon dinner. I would possibly watch for 173 to break to see if it can revisit that lower one. Um, but take profits on your shorts. Take profits on your shorts. PayPal heavily requested ticker this evening. PayPal primary trend on the daily. We have uh, a topping pattern. We want to look at the last year. So we want to look since December 1st of 2020. So for here. So do you see why I'm ident identifying that on the chart? Because I want to pull it over and just look at this for what it is. Okay. So this is um, another ticker that we talk about a lot in our podcast show. If you haven't joined us for that Tuesday and Thursday mornings and Friday afternoons. Tomorrow we have a special guest Byron on with us on Friday. But this is revisiting a strong demand zone. There's a strong demand for price at this level for buying. This is the supply zone up here. This is a good example of trading the range right here. Even if you, um, when you make an entry like this, the maneuver is you want to layer, layer your entries. And I'm going to use green because green to me is buy making money. You want to layer your entries into this demand zone and you want to set your stop outside of the demand zone. I always use red for my stops because that's my my color cue. If you look at the structure, you want to ask yourself with your stop, how much money can I lose? If it's not a lot of money, tighten this up. If you're willing to wait through a little uh, movement and structure, you know, get this out of here a little bit and place some more entries. But the reason with PayPal that you want to have this around where I showed you before is because this is a demand zone. People should be wanting to buy it, which is what you're seeing starting to come back in here on the daily, which means price should go up. If it loses, then that means that this is no longer seen as a demand zone. PayPal is no longer seen as a valuable deal for 175 to 185, which means it will go lower. So this would be my play for PayPal. Um, I'd want to have you double check the sectors and indexes, which we can do if we have time at the end here. I don't know that we will because I'm purely here to serve you. That's my main goal as a coach, as a teacher. And um, But I, w I really like this one for a long run, especially, I mean, since PayPal got into crypto earlier in the year. 
Uh, I don't know if any of you have used it. I have, but it's fairly decent. So we had another second upstart. Um, I had an AMC request. And AMC here, uh, we had some patterns where we were making higher lows, but we were making lower highs. So we had an example of that triangle. So what did I tell you to do with the uh, triangles is measure the opening of the triangle and then apply that. So you've got 60% here. That's crazy because it's AMC, of course. It's crazy, right? The apex, you can run it up to 60% and mark that as a PT. Boom. You can take from the apex 60% down here. Mark that as a TP. Boom. What I see here, um, what we want to look for now is confluence. Which one of these is showing more signs of strength? Think of these as a magnet. Which one is stronger for price to go off of? The one that has more confluence of other factors will have a stronger magnetism. This one has more because this was an old resistance that has not been tested as a support. So likely AMC was going to go down here. How could you identify that it was going to go down here? When you watched it break through that trend and and fail to swing these highs, this was the opportunity to short right here. And if you shorted, you made a killing. If you're in AMC, the person I believe who uh, shared this with me um, had some long calls for $60. Do I think that AMC could get back to $60? Yeah, eventually. Uh, I'm hoping that they're, those are long, long long calls and I would look to, I wouldn't add any more contracts at this time I would wait for price to find a bottom some of my buying areas would be the 50% of this candle right here um, and that would be one one entry just in case it wants to swing it and go up the mother candle gives birth to the new trend usually at that 50% mark price will find a little bit of buyers my next layer would be uh, here and I'm going off of this candle here this resistance from this wick and here another 50 percent marker so i would be looking if you're in um, puts this is these could be some pts for your shorts if you're looking for long entries i would hold off for now on amc good luck uh progenity prog praga praga prog i think uh Bahamut, he posted a chart for me or um, to help out some of the requests because i know i'm running a little bit behind i'm gonna actually just um I'll look at this for literally a minute, but I really, again, another valued um, analyst, really, really appreciate his ideas. And what I'm seeing here, primary downtrend, uh, are we going up or are we going down? We went down. We're trying to recover to the up. Where do you want to see this find a support? You want to see price find support here. Blue are my key levels. Here or here. Lost it, lost it. Where's the next one? Down here. I'd short it to two, two dollars, maybe two dollars fifty cents. But I would probably consider entering long just to see if it plays off this upward move around one sixty nine. Ha <laughs> ha, one sixty nine. Good job. Hopefully, Bahamut's chart is more mature than mine. Um, but thank you for helping to pick up the slack there, y'all. Appreciate everybody who's um, helping out our members. Lucid. Lucid is um, a <laughs> shit show of a stock, bro. Um, their cars are pretty cool, you know, cars are pretty cool. But we had earnings, and I usually don't play earnings within 10 days post or prior, so held off on that one for a bit. Um, but Lucid here is forming, what is the primary trend if we look at it on the year? Is it going up or down? Really, you're seeing um, some sections of consolidation. Consolidation distribution up here consolidation distribution right here. If you're looking at this as being a supply zone, because this is an old resistance area where price has not broken through yet, and you're looking at these bottom areas where people liked to buy as being a demand zone, and you can also use volume to correlate with this, you see, okay, price was here, people bought. When it did here, look at that buying section. If you want to see some other spots where people like to buy, there are other indicators you can use, like volume profiles that will show you based on the price. Um, but I don't want to overwhelm you here today, so I'm going to stick with the OG volume. Look here. Look where this was. Boom. This guy right here. So there was a lot of action here. Why was that happening here? Why did it break through here? Because this was a resistance 
that was broken through. Now you have to ask yourself, where's the next support? If it's not going to break through supply on this run, where will it come down to to test? I see three areas I would like to see it stop if you're going to take, or PTs for a short, of around $40. Remember those round numbers have importance. Um, this area right here, around $35. And then last but not least, you're looking at the, you see this wick, 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 but this guy right here, this price action right here, where there was selling and then people bought it up, this middle ground right here in confluence with these wicks would be my areas for Lucid. For Lucid, trading the range, Lucid is a good example right now of trading the range. If it's going to break through, it would, it would have some crazy news, some catalyst and go through here, but why do we think that's not going to happen? Number one, third time's the charm. This was the first test. This was the second test. Not the third test. We're seeing selling. When it sells, it goes down. Trade the range here. Take some, um, I take some shorts, and I would start PTing around $40. You could do it earlier if you wanted to go for the scalp and go for this range. I really like that play as well. But um, you want to have some of your hold on to some for this big range. Other people will say this is a cup and handle. I know some people are saying, look at this, but let me tell you about chart patterns real quick. Yeah, this could become a handle, in which case it would retest that old resistance of support and then bounce off. Sure, maybe. I'll post that as an example. But what you need to look for with chart patterns are confluence. What could happen here is instead of that becoming a handle, you could, um, this thing could GG out, come back down here all the way to demand zone form a double bottom and then come back up. So you don't want to be stuck bag holding here with um, with some long calls when you should have been trading the range, trading this primary trend. The way to look for that is when price reapproaches here, wait to see if these levels hold. Wait to see if this cuts through like butter, which means it wants to dump back into that demand, or if it's doing some sideways consolidation, which means people are buying it up. Check those volume profiles, okay? So that's my opinion on Lucid. Next we've got, actually let me stop. Any questions? Y'all feel free to interrupt me. Okay, cool. We're, we got our flow going down. Airbnb. A, B, and baby. Let's go. Okay, so on the daily, what's our primary trend? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I can't. I can't with this stuff sometimes, man. So um, Airbnb right now is a really good example of a classic SR flip. You've got some supports and resistances here that have been tested. Tail is all this time, right? So it came through here. Didn't want to hold dumped it. Came back up here, didn't want to break through, dumped it. So you've got some demand buying where? It's not here. People aren't buying here. People are selling. The demand is coming from this mother candle, this big bullish candle right here, about the 50% mark. You can get technical and break out the measuring tool and measure, but why I like to do the rectangles is because you'll see from the bodies of those candles where people were buying, right? Where people were buying. It touched once, twice and then it's off to the races. Now where are people selling Airbnb? Well, look at this resistance zone. The red um, VK, yes. The red to me is supply. This means there's too much in supply. People want to sell it. This is the price they want to sell it for. Red means selling. Green means demand. This is the price they want to buy it for. Green means buying. Thank you for that clarifying question. I hope that helps others as well. I really like questions, guys. I'm here to help you, not to hear myself talk. And looking at this range right here, Airbnb. Is it at the top of the range, the middle of the range, or the bottom of the range? Middle of the range. If good traders, most profitable traders, they aren't trading the middle of the range. They're waiting for the top or the bottom of the range. Could this come all the way down here to the screen again? Yes, absolutely. Will it? I don't think so. I think it will come down to this region. <laughs> John, I love you. Uh, I think it'll come here. I think it will come in this area because it will have some stronger support from this price action right here. Um, but if we look here at our secondary trend from September, the other thing that we're seeing that makes me feel like it might not come all the way back down to this demand zone is a, a bit of an uptrend for some time. 
Uh, sorry, I got distracted by a question. So it could come down here and then continue up. Or it really could come visit this green thing for round number three. If this thing comes down here, guys, buy it. Buy it. Boom. Airbnbs. I don't know if you if y'all have rented one recently, but these people are living out of these, like renting out of them these days. If Airbnb comes and stays at these support levels, I would consider longing, taking some small entries for a long as well. Otherwise, right now, don't trade this. Don't enter this trade. Um, you don't want to be trading in the middle of the ranges. That's not what the best traders do. Wait for the setups. We've already shared some setups that are in supply and some setups that are in demand. Those ones have the most probability on your side because of confluence. BV, you had a good question for me. You said, do you see a mother candle in the supply zone just the way you pointed out in the demand zone? I'm going to show you a trick, my mans. BV, inverting the chart is an absolute freaking game changer. The way I view a mother candle let me explain to you, anybody who hasn't heard this in a lesson from me before, is it's a big bullish candle that gives birth, that's why I call it mother, right, to a new price structure, a new market structure, or a new trend. So you see how I'm identifying this one? I like to identify the candle that's towards the bottom, that's bullish, full-bodied, and mark the halfway point. I can do that up here at the top, excuse me, but I want to look at... uh inverting the scale just for my eyes to see it better. So um, maybe we call this the deadbeat dad candle instead of the mother candle because it sells and runs away. I like that. I'm going to call that the BV dead, deadbeat dad candle. There's not really one here that's full bodied, full of selling. The biggest one you can see, the deadbeat dad right here. We mark it at the 50%. Boom. Let's do it. Then we invert the chart again. I love you so much, BV, for helping me... Uh, do that and so what you can see next time if you want to have a long that could be a PT you want to have your PT with round numbers around 200 just to be on the safe side your first one then your second one could be the deadbeat dad leaving for cigs and milk for the gas station not coming back and then your third one let it test to run these highs in supply let it see if it will get to 210 215 and 220 so those are my Airbnb uh, this is pretty much the same chart but I'm gonna add here dead beat dad candle so you can help with your price targets I'm adding Amazon to the list for you couple magic we have uh, four tickers left on my on the clock we got 15 minutes we're going well I'm happy to stay a little longer if it helps anybody we're looking at QS next let me erase all my garbage all my junk primary trend is it spent most of the last year we want to find December 1st so here Look at this nice big mother candle. Look at that bad boy. Ooh. All right. Primary trend. Have we spent more time going up or have we spent more time going down? We spent more time going down. Sometimes to help yourself, if you aren't sure, you want to help, um, you want to identify the height, the highest points, and connect them together. Seamless. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Um, to help you see the trend. So is the line going up? Or is the line going down, right? Next, we want to look at our secondary trend. We want to look for that September 1st date, and let's identify it here. Is this spending more time going up, or is this spending more time going down? You can give yourself some trends off the bottom lines. You can give yourself some trends by connecting the tops. Usually, price, we want to look at the higher time frame first. So we see on QuantumScape, we've got that primary downtrend but what is it looking to do here? It's an ascending, broadening wedge. It's looking like it wants to come up. When price comes into convergence with these levels here, what price is doing here is consolidating. It's trying to find a range. It's trying to find its price. It's trying to find its value. This is going to be a pivotal moment. This is going to be the time when it chooses up or down. How, do you, how can you place your bets on probability on whether it will go up or down? by using confluence. So let's identify some other factors here. Let's find some supports and resistances. If we see this big mother candle here from this time last year, this is our primary trend candle, and we mark the 50% on the mother, what do we see? We see a strong areas of confluence here. This became, a, it wanted to be tested as a support, then it became a resistance. Now when it was tested as resistance for the third time's a charm, boom, broke through. Now, why did price reject here? Other than our identification of trends, what else do you see? 
I see a strong resistance point here. A nice, what used to be a support, is now trading as a resistance. So what you can do is identify those areas of resistance here at the top, like that. That's going to be an area of supply. And then an area of buying as an area of demand. That 50% of the mother candle, we saw that it went down below it. That means the swing, when it came back to swing origin and returned to where it was from, it didn't hold to go up. It started failing. So you've got your demand zone all the way down here at the bottom. When you see now that price has left this demand zone, you got to ask yourself, do I think it will revisit it? Find some smaller time frame supports and resistances or key levels to chart your entries and determine probabilities. Now we have a really good look right here at QuantumScape. What do we think price can do if we remain curious about this? Well, we can look at volume, we can look at our primary trends and our secondary trends, and we can look at our supply and demand zone. We're nearing this demand zone where people are going to want to buy it up, so price will likely to stay down here and then come up to try and retest this resistance, this supply zone. What it will really likely do is it'll probably come through get bought up in this area, maybe a little consolidation, right? little question mark, but I don't even think it will go that low. Why? Because it has this other smaller trend to contend with. I think it will be bought up in this area. It will go through here to break through this resistance. Maybe it might not have a lot of juice to it. Maybe it will um, consolidate underneath this as a resistance. And then it will break in, uh, into an uptrend. Where do we think a resistance could be? Where could we set a PT for a nice long? Well, let's use this old structure where this where this resistance would flip into a support. We can set a, a conservative PT down here. We can set a PT right here. We can set another PT up here. Those are my opinions on quantum skate. QS is the ticker. Um, some really good finds here tonight. I want to say that uh, some of the people who I have seen in lessons before, I'm actually feeling very impressed at uh, how you're identifying your trades. So keep that up. Keep that up. OEG. OEG, what do we see? Primary trend up or down or move it all around. Okay, so we see December... 2020, we see primary downtrend. We see primary downtrend. What about our secondary trend? You can connect the highs here. What about our secondary trend? We want to look for September 1st. What are we seeing? Shoo! Shoo! This bitch sleeping! What's it doing? What's going on? It lost a support, number one. Okay, next, it lost the this mother candle right here that tried to make this thing happen. Uh-uh, it said no. There's another SR flip. So where can we see price going down to now? Where do we see our next area of confluence? This whole chunk of price right here, there was a lot of buying going on. So there's some strength here. There's some strength here. But where could we set a shelf? Where could price rest a little bit? Maybe as deep as there. So what I see for quantum scape, this isn't quantum scape. I'm sorry if I was saying QS, OEG, possible demand zone it's in right now. But I'm uh, hesitant to say so. To me, this looks, this has a few red flags on it. Um, let me just tell you if we think it could go where we think it could go, it could go up here hypothetically, but let me tell you the red flags I'm seeing. First and foremost, it lost a ton of support. A ton of support. Second, the red flags are prime, unless you're shorting, in which case, you know, haha, <laughs> right? Primary downtrend, stinker. Secondary trend, <laughs> trash. Pr minor time frame trend, dumpster fire, losing support, right? The biggest red flag of this guy of all is this big volume candle right here. This is the signature pump and dump telegram scheme. Some dude who had too much money and time on his hands was like, yo, this is at a demand zone. Buy it. And boom. Or I bet you there was some news here for June 1st for OEG. 
How can we check that? At the beginning of the lesson, I told you you can look for news or confluence or anything that comes up in those time frames you see on your chart down here. So what do we say? June 1st. What happened with OEG June 1st? Orbital Energy Group's recently acquired subsidiary, Gibson Technology Services, reaches agreement with TEC on 700 miles. Okay, so they mergers and acquisitions, baby. So they're buying new things. So you see how I, I haven't looked at this shit. I've never traded at this stock, but I'm able to determine from June 1st, there was a rumor, okay, there are mergers and acquisitions that got their stock to buy up. But guess what? Still couldn't get the job done. Performance issues. Other than a merger and acquisition, what motivation does this downtrending red flag bad boyfriend of a stock have to give you jack shit? I would not be in this unless you see price fines, a bottom and starts to show signs of reversal. Then what you could do, your little scout play, could be on one of these entries, you know, uh, just to play to this resistance. That looks like it's nothing, and yeah, your money's probably better served elsewhere, but it's a 26% a move. Once you get into these smaller time frames on these penny stocks, you can do more of that if you want to, but my two cents as a trader, it's just not worth it when there are other plenty of other stocks out there that aren't as red flaggy <laughs> to do that. If you wanted to be really ballsy with this stock, for some reason short it, you could, but let me tell you why that would make you the red flag and problem. It's because this thing is in a demand zone, all right? So you've got to you've got to think that you're going against trend by doing that. So whomever is in OEG, my hopes for you, my man's, my brother, my sister, my lover, pray to God pretty god you were shorting uh i wouldn't buy here just put your money somewhere else unless there's something here i didn't see which uh what i look for is volume 1 million plus check performance year to date is 25 percent plus for me which doesn't pass next institutional ownership i look for 60 percent plus doesn't pass my check next is a recent ipo because there's uh less resistances for it to run through and I don't even care about that because I just know the stock is trash so there you go that's my opinions on oh we already did coop we had two coop um offers sir or asks for a ticker request so if you were asking for coop later please scroll up in the chat I'm sure I posted a chart next we've got um Amazon simple guy I am adding VBIV and hood to the list Amazon. All right. We, again, just like Tesla, if you follow me in options chat, Amazon Tesla is my bread and butter. Uh, Ted Stoner, yes, indeed, this is being recorded. Okay, so Amazon, what do we have going on here? What's our primary trend? Is it spending more time going up or is it spending more time going down? You know what Amazon's doing? Amazon is the biggest, like, um, oh, thank you, Ted Stoner. It's like a cuck, you know, it's you've wanted to break up any one of these minutes now and it's just not going. It keeps finding these smaller time frame support resistance flips to test and it's just at this point, I mean, uh, it's the middle of a range. Let me clear this out, okay? So when you want to identify the primary trend, do we see it going up or do we see it going down? If you come to these consolidation points, here's what I tell my students who have trouble with the trend lines, or they say, this doesn't really look like a trend to me. You're absolutely right, sir. What you want to do then is just go by price. Find, um, find December 1st or December 2nd, 3rd, whatever today's date is, and look at that price zone and mark it on your chart. What do you have there? You can do a ray, you can do a horizontal ray, but what I'm seeing here is around three thousand two hundred nineteen dollars. Um, what I'm seeing here for the price today is around three thousand four hundred. Okay, so there's your primary trend. How much did it go up from here to here? Seven and a half percent. Even though people think, "Wow, it's up hundreds of dollars," this is why we use percentages in the field of finance because all money and amounts are relative. Percentages is the way that we can relate to the things, right? Huh? Hey, question. Ah, oh, bummer. Hey, um, too naughty. What do you mean by Amazon and Tesla is your bread and butter? Bread and butter is a euphemism or, figure, euphemism or figure of speech, meaning like, this is my wheelhouse, this is what I'm good at, this is my main meal, this is my main source of 
sustenance. Amazon and Tesla are my most frequently traded stocks um, because they are the most profitable for me because I trade them so often. I know the charts, all that good stuff. So that's what I mean by bread and butter. Uh, for Amazon, what do we think it's doing for our secondary trend? Let's identify September 1st around this region here. Ooh, look at that. Boom. Two. Now, this is our secondary trend on Amazon. Is it spending more time going up or is it spending more time going down? When you have this whipsaw, this up and down where it looks like it's going up, but really it's not, we can't really know, just compare the price values. It was 35.25 at the beginning of the secondary trend and now it's 34, so it's going down. The other things you can do are connect these peaks. Remember, connect the tops and connect the bottoms. It's just playing connect the dots like when you were a kid to identify. So we have the primary trend, and not to confuse you, I'll change this um, color up here, and we have a secondary trend. So let's stay curious. Where do we feel that price is going? Um, VK. Oh, JP Mog. I know I love you. Hearing your voice was the highlight of my day. Well, that's, the, that's the end of our session, getting to hear J.P. Mock's voice. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, VK asked a question. Thank you for your question. He says, how do, how do you identify secondary trend? And it's always from September. Um, here's what I want to tell you on that one, my guy. So primary trend, I want to type this out. I don't like writing it. Okay, primary trend is one year. So you take today's date, which is 12 to 21, and you go back one year, which would be 12 to 2020. All right, that's why I'm choosing the dates on the chart. A secondary trend is going to be three months, okay? So you take today's date, and you go back three months. This is where I'm pulling those September dates from. It's not always September. That's just the time from today day, right? And then the last one is a minor trend or small time frame trend, and that's going to be three weeks. Okay, so we've mostly been looking at primary and secondary trends today. What we're looking at with Amazon um, is we have a primary trend that's sort of not doing too much, 7%. We have a secondary trend that's sort of in this ascending broadening wedge. What do we think about Amazon? Where do we think price could go? Let's be curious. Let's look for some confluence here. Do we see buying or selling more? You see some similarities here. You see strong sells, stronger buying. Is it worth taking a chance buying in this range and thinking that it could continue in this secondary trend pattern? Well, I see something here. Does anybody see anything here? What about this guy right here? What do we call her? The Earth Mother swing of origin, a mother candle. We also have this area that was a resistance before that how now has an opportunity to be in support. So if you're going to take a position on Amazon, you could try and enter in, layer in your entries here with that 50% mark and go for the long if price continues up this direction. However, if price breaks this support, because it's going with the primary trend and wanting to bounce between those blue channels instead of this purple channel, then where do we think price could go? Look at some other areas we've seen before. I'm looking right here at this guy. Could be a target for a short. This guy right here, you see wick, wick. It didn't want to break up through there. It had some resistance here, it had some resistance here, and then we have a PT here as well. So those are our short PTs if this pri if this secondary trend doesn't hold this purple diagonal ascending. Um, this isn't actually, I said, call it ascending broadening wedge, but that's incorrect. This is a rising wedge. What price likes to do typically in a rising wedge is to come up and then it's either going to consolidate here and break out, but if it shows that it's going to come back down to the bottom, then it's going to shit the bed, Charlie Day style. So, my Amazon decisions are here, but since I had multiple requests for this one, let me go a little more in depth. Um, when are you, so Ted Stoner asks, 
Actually, let me go back. i got to stay chronological, y'all. Uh, Too Naughty, can you point me out some of your Amazon Tesla plays or ideas that you discussed in the past? Whew, girl. Um, I've probably posted more than, I say girl, but really human person. 2021, right? Uh, just search my name and the tickers and you'll be disgusted. Um, I'd love to do that, but for the sake of time, I have a few other requests. Uh, oh, thank you, Gara, for showing that. Appreciate it. Um, the X Trades app, guys. I'm not um I'm not good at using the bot. I've been trying to start it soon, but I'm very live in act in options chat. I'm a scalper. That's my um strategy. I'm small time frame. So by the time I take entries and I go to post it in the bot, I 90% of the time have already exited or my premium entry has passed. So I don't feel comfortable alerting that yet. But when I go for some of my swing plays, some of my higher time frame swing trading, which is what I'm going to be getting into the into in the coming months since I'm going to be a little too busy to do my uh, scalping I will be using the bot more so I'm figuring out the bugs and kinks right now but um, I will definitely make a better effort to chart my trades in there for your following in the app but for me mostly just uh, search my name search Amazel or Amy and then your ticker and um, you'll see me spamming stupid quantities of ideas sometimes um, with big fan, you say Amazon and Tesla almost have a randomness to when they are going to have very short-term explosive breakouts to the upside. Are there any patterns or key indicators that you watch to provide some type of improved predictability to these? Big fan, that is an awesome, awesome question. If you were with us for our fun, with Stefan and I for our fundamentals lesson uh, yesterday, we went over a few indicators that we like to use. Um, one of them is VWAP. Another one is uh, Bollinger Bands or Bollinger Bands and um, moving averages, RSI. So if you are looking for, and I love this question too because it shows me you've really been paying attention in the lesson of looking for confluence, right? Like how many things can I get in the bullish category? How many things can I get in the bearish category? So what you can do is um, looking at the RSI, uh, for example, you want to look for the areas between 30 and 70. These are similar to the supply and demand zones where people are going to start buying around 30s and they're going to be looking for selling, or there's going to be some more selling pressure around 70s. We want to not play the middle of the range, which is sort of what's going on here with Amazon, which is why I gave you both um, both hypothetical scenarios and the PTs. But with the RSI here, RSI is sitting at 45. I would wait. Um, you can do the same things with RSIs that you can with your charting. Sometimes it won't go as low as into the 30s. Sometimes it will find a support to trend upwards. You see that happening in some of these um, areas past. But for the most part, what people are waiting on with Amazon here is for it to make a decision of up or down. You're absolutely right that there's explo short-term explosive breakouts, but, but you're incorrect by saying to the upside because there's also to the downside. This thing, if if any stock can be volatile to the upside, it can also be inversed and have volatility to the downside. In Amazon, and these contracts are expensive if you're playing options, there's a double top here that, um, I mean, it just dropped it was almost from the actually from the listing of the day from the height of the day it was like 10 almost 10 percent drop so there's explosive breakouts and drops to the upside and the downside on these a lot of these stocks are unfortunately manipulated but they're also just so heavily traded that's a really actually great um great thing for them if you trade because the more volume means more movement all right, which means more profitability for you if you're playing the probability. Volume, I usually said in my indicators, what I look for is more than 1 million. These stocks are trading at 3 or 4 million plus on any given day. So that's what I'm looking at with Amazon. For Ted Stoner, you say his time frame same across all types of trends. This guy right here, I'll give a little screenshot. This is what I'm using, Ted, Teddy boy. Ted from How I Met Your Mother, um, is time frame same across all types of trend? The time frame is when you're charting it today, but let's say in three months I'm looking at Amazon. I'm not going to be looking at September to December Amazon. I'm going to be looking at December to March Amazon. Does that make sense? Charles, when would you use a minor trend? Good question. When we're looking at these higher time frame trends, we always want to go from, I want you to think about stock tickers as a forest and the individual candles as the trees. So if you're a bird and you're trying to get an overview perspective, you want to be looking at the forest instead of the trees and then go down into the forest 
to identify those smaller time frame price actions. So Charles, when would you use a minor trend? So the minor trend is three weeks. When would we use a minor trend? When we're doing a swing trade or when we're in the stock and we want to be in and out within three weeks. Okay. So you can also be using minor trends if you're day trading or scalping, like I said, where we can be looking at some of these smaller time frame pieces of price action, recharting and making our decisions there. When you're using a minor trend, you, you're likely using one of three trading styles. One is intraday or day trading. Two is scalping, which is day trading on crack, which is just like in and out, in and out, in and out. Or three is swing trading, which is not holding. It's holding, by definition, holding for less than a year, but holding for more than a day. So that can be really um, interesting time. But the reason you want to use, uh, let me go back to a bigger time frame here, bud. Um, the reason you still find minor trends helpful is because even though the higher time frames hold more weight to the directional movement of the stock, you want to be not just capitalizing on the probabilities in these high time frames, you want to be capitalizing on getting the best entry possible. This is where we give a shit about minor trends. This is where we care about where price is going on small time frames. This is where we care about layering our entries. Because let's say that Amazon is about to go um, go long here. Let's say Amazon is about to continue up in this wedge and come rechallenge this 3700 level again, which it very well could. Here's where I use minor trends, Charles. I want to plan my entries. And I want to look at what price would be best to get it at. Well, I could enter in here. I could be entering um, here as another layered entry. And I'm using that because these candles, do you see how this line didn't exist when I was on high time frames? You're going to see other patterns emerge when you look on small time frames. These minor trends that are three weeks. So just to, just to specify here for you, if we're looking at three weeks, let me pull up my calendar. December 2nd. November 25th, November 18th, November 11th through 18th ish is a minor trend. So where am I looking at that for? I just use the shapes because I'm a visual person. November 18th, this is our minor trend. Boom, look at that. Look at that. That's a minor trend. When would you use a minor trend? When you're playing off of higher time frames and you're in confluence with that to plan a premium short entry, we couldn't swing this high, we didn't break out, you could have shorted here and you would have made an 8% profit if you were following that minor trend going and you're saying this is to the downside. Likewise, if you're going to look at this entry and you're going to watch Amazon tomorrow and Monday, there is a chance that it doesn't bounce here because the primary trend is still has this range down here. So this wedge could break. Okay? This wedge could break. And what minor what would you use as your defense for it could break? Well, you have three categories. You have your minor trend, you have your secondary trend, and you have your minor trend or your small time frame trend, three weeks. Primary trend on Amazon right now, is that giving me bullish or bearish vibes? The primary trend has this blue lines. It's primarily bullish, but where's price at in relativity to it now? A bearish, it wants to come down here and test this area. The minor, the secondary trend that we're looking at for three months, what's it giving me? Bullish or bearish? Bullish, this rising wedge. The small time frame trend, the minor trend, is it giving me up or is it giving me down? Down. That's a two to one ratio. That means probability is on your side for that bearish play. So there's an opportunity, it could, ha it could happen. So when you're looking at, that's such a good question. When would you use a minor trend? Whenever you're looking to plan premium entries to increase your risk to reward ratio so that you're taking trades that are one to four or one to three instead of one to two or one to one. And also to help maximize your profit. Clear as day, clear as day. Uh, new trader, thank you for bumping the thread, adding those to the list. So next I've got VBIV. Hood, Twitter, and DraftKings. So hang tight if you're interested in those. At this point, guys, I'm running 15 minutes over schedule. I'm still going to go because I'm here for you until um, until we ain't no mo. We're going to shut it down. You don't have to go home, but you don't have to stay here. If you're interested in these, um, hang tight. 
VBIV, Hood, Twitter, and DraftKing. Otherwise, hope you got something out of the session. I'm not going to be offended if you leave. Um, thank you so much for the kind words, guys. That means a lot to me. This is really just, this is why I do what I do. Love it so much. John is ab absolutely correct. We have academy sessions every week going over the fundamentals. Um, Ted Stoner, do I use anchored VWAP and in what situations or trend? I have to be honest with you, I don't use a lot of indicators. Ted, I use them for my bias checking because I read the price action, I read the candles, and I go off of the basics. Sometimes when you use indicators, bro, I'm just going to put this on just so I could show you. It gets messy. The more Sometimes um, you get analysis paralysis, right? There's too much going on and you're like, but it's here, but it's there, blah, 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 blah. This is why we want to go shh, right? Just look at the trend. Is it going up or is it going down? So to answer your question, do I use anchored VWAP? I'm going to be 100% honest with you. No. So in what situations or, or what trend? Um, when I do use VWAP, it's in a scalping capacity. I'll use a VWAP trend, Ted, uh, when I'm trying to plan for an entry or exit. And I'm like, good, this is primo. I see that it's the bottom of the secondary trend. It's at the bottom of the minor time frame trend. It's at the bottom of VWAP. Where do I think price will go? I think it'll go to at least the middle of VWAP. I'd set that as my first PT. And then my next one. When it comes to anchored and all the fancy stuff, no, bro, I'm not about that life. Like, honestly, the fewer indicators, the better sometimes. But that's just because I'm also, um, I don't want to have too much because then there's too much to digest. Analysis paralysis is the enemy. Uh, John, thank you so much for helping out with these questions, man. I'm just, it's crazy. Uh, VK, is VWAP work only for day time frame? Um, when you're doing this, you notice then that I did pull up VWAP. It's not really going to give you much. It's not going to give you much. The candles are going to tell you everything you need to know because volume weighted average price, the candle tells you this is the open this is where it closed. Price opened here at 350, 35.30, and it closed at 36.75. Guys, I would really, instead of relying on some indicators, um, here's what I would advise you to do. If you want to be serious about your trading and you want to learn to read price action, uh, I want you to do, number one, learn how to read candles. Number two, uh, Look at YouTube. Look for Heikinashi. We actually have some lessons on this coming in X Hub, and I know we have some of our analysts who have gone through it. But Heikinashi is basically price action that's helping you identify minor trends. Okay, so that's I understand the candle itself. I understand the candles and the partners around it. And then last but not least is um, looking at the trends of the candles, right? But really, when you're looking at these candles. The price action, this is when you want to start to understand how the candles, instead of doing trends, how they set the pace for what's happening around them. Like, here's a swing high, here's a swing low, here's a swing high, here's a swing low. What you want to do is ask yourself, are we making higher highs? Are we making lower lows? Because that's going to give you a cue in which direction it's going to go off of. So, um, when you're talking about, is VWAP work only for day time frame? Um, price for day time frame what I want you to do when you learn how to read candles is to just read candles on the daily honestly look how this is one day's worth of trading on July 6th Amazon opened at 35.30 and it closed at 36.77 or something okay that is what I want you to do you can be a successful trader if you learn to read candlesticks and then you look at a daily chart period that's all you need to do to make money and be able to tell up or down <laughs> you know, it gets um, blown out of proportion, up or down, up or down, buying or selling, okay? And then the candlesticks tell you your entries for buying or selling, all right? So we've we've beaten Amazon to death, but this was a really good one for lots of examples on other stuff. Thanks for the follow-up questions, guys. Um, thanks again for the kind words. Uh, Kentropy, do you have a minute to go over a 20,000 foot view of your scalping strategy. These trends seem more ideal for longer swings. Are you targeting intraday support and resistance for scalping? Yes, Ken. Um, my my TLDR of my scalping strategy is exactly what I'm doing now, actually. Every morning or every night, never in the day time frame, I identify, never in the day time frame. What I mean by that is never during the trading session. Okay, so TLDR, a missiles scalping strategy. I identify primary, I identify all three trends before the trading session starts. Then, 
when I'm in there, I have all this crap marked up on my chart and I'm in a three or five minute session and I'm watching three things primarily. I'm watching volume because that's telling me when people are buying or selling. I'm watching for these minor trends and then I just go through, Ken, boom. I just come through here and I mark all of these key levels and I'm looking at these levels and I'm watching price and I'm asking myself by those candle bodies, by the way the candles, candle bodies form, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Where is it going to stall out? Where should I sell? I'm going for very small time frame scalps. I'm going for 0.7 to 1%, which in an options contract will yield you maybe 15 to 25%. I'm not going for anything crazy, but I'm looking for those premium entries. And when that's, those scalps can, when they coincide with the confluence here, like I see this bounce possible of trend, I see supports here, I'm taking that scalp and guess what? I might not sell it right away because it might ride up. Every trade you enter, enter with the mind frame of it being a scalp if you're going to try and do the day trading thing because you want to be able to play hot potato. You don't want to hold it in your hands and get burned. Okay, you want to be able to hop it off. And how do you know when to hop it off? Those key levels just going in. That's why my charts are annoying sometimes when I pose because they wind up looking like this. And this doesn't give people information. The high time frame stuff is cleaner. That gives information. The small time frame stuff is Amazel's crazy pants, crackhead energy, day trading stuff. Omar, VK, Galrov, everybody, thank you so much for the kind words. New trader, awesome. Uh, D Raw, great, thank you so much. Uh, Ted, I was a teacher for eight years. To use the phrase again for a second time, this is my bread and butter, baby. I love it. I love it. Um, I have a few more tickers, and then I'm gonna get get uh heading out here today. So let's go for VBIV vaccines. To Naughty, I saw you just had a question. Uh, let's see. When you scalp, do you go for weekly contracts or do you buy longer duration contracts? You can skip this question. It's off your agenda. To Naughty, no. I genuinely, look, I live for your questions. I am here for you. I'm not here for myself. Um, so if I'm, and it's actually on topic because Ken just convinced me to give the TLDR of my secret sauce. So my scalping strategies, do I go for weekly contracts? Yes. Let me tell you why. Because the shorter the contract, um, if I think that I'm only going to hold it for a few minutes or maybe even a few hours, then I don't need to buy time. My strategy, if it's low time, I'm picking same week expiries. I'm going for Fridays. Um, this There's a few analysts who do this as well. You'll see it sometimes. Uh, Wags does it. Um, but my boy Guru, who is my um, podcast bestie, and JTW, his daily spy plan is always playing same day expiries. So when you're going for scalping, you do have two options. You can still buy time, but what you don't have is the Greeks working in your favor to increase and juice up your profit, right? But if you're going for the same week expiration, you have that juice in there. The problem is you have to have balls of steel to do this because you can't go in going, I'm going to get that juicy Amazon weekly contract because it's cheap and I know it's going to go in this. You don't know anything. You have to be just as willing to lose what you're putting in as you are to profit. So when I go to scout personally, am I going for weeklies? Yes, because it's better for my risk management because I'm using less of my capital. I'm um, more confident in my ability to play hot potato, right? I'm not going for the big win, but because of that 1% move in Amazon, I can, in a weekly contract, I could profit 45% instead of taking a two or three week out contract where I'm only going to profit about 15% because of the way IV works, um, you know, like the Delta, the Theta, the Vega, all that good stuff. So thank you for that. Um, John agrees with me. He says, I personally go for weekly because it yields more results, but it comes with more risk. Absolutely. Double-edged sword to all of this stuff. Too naughty, though. I do want to clarify. Sometimes, like with Amazon, if I were going to take a scalp on that right now, I would go further out because it could go in either direction. So if you're prof, if you're probable, if you're 80, 20 or 70, 30, go for a weekly. If you're not sure, don't take the trade to begin with. But if you're going for swings, go for longer. Buy time buy time. Anytime you can afford it, buy time. It's just giving you an extra cushion for your risk management. Learning Trader, very detailed explanation. Thank you, but also I'm sorry because I know sometimes I'll get passionate and some of my newbie traders, um, please give me feedback in the DMs. I welcome all questions, comments, concerns, but uh, Learning Trader, if you're following me or if you guys are just taking on like a sponge, um, 
I'm happy that my explanations are being helpful for you. Thank you for that. Crazy guru is right. Uh, for weeklies, do you play in the money or at the money? Or it's dependent on deltas. And yeah, it depends on the price of the contract. Um, I usually, most people will see my plays. I like to go one or two out of the money if it's because it's going to be significantly cheaper if I think that it's going to go there. Let me tell you when that works, Ted. Uh, when you are charting the primary, this is why charting the trends are important. If I chart the primary, secondary, and minor trends on Amazon, and if I'm going for the scout play, let's use this one as an example, I can take a little out of the money, um, a little further out of the money call because I think it's going to get there because I see that I have all of these, conf all of this confluence of traits that are going to push the trade in my favor. The more probable I am, the more um, willing I am to be flexible on, on my prices, on all that stuff. When you play in the money, you're guaranteed to get more profit, but you also remember you profit from the range that the price takes. So what you have to measure is what your risk is. So for weeklies, my personal thing is I do, um, I, it, it depends on how much I'm spending. If I'm going to be totally honest with you, I vary. I'm not a person who's like, I always go too out of the money. No, it depends on the price of the contracts. It depends on the other factors of trends and it depends on um, my strategy. Cause sometimes you're buying some that are at the money, out of the money, in the money. You know, stuff like that. But yeah, it's all dependent on the Greeks, bro. Too naughty, thank you so much. Cup of magic, thank you so much. Big fan. Options. If you do end up holding on to a single leg long, too long. Oh yeah, we've all been there. Do you typically cut quickly, roll it down or out, do a repair by selling a short leg against it? A uh, big fan, I'll do a ghetto spread. A ghetto spread is um, selling the neighboring call. So let's say I took a $150 call on Apple and um, the trade is not going in my favor, it's going to like a 145. I will sell uh, the next call, which would be like a 152.50 to help cover some of my loss if I'm a, a pattern day trader, if I'm against PDT flagging rules to help cover some of that. Um, using the search bar in the server of uh, ghetto spread will yield you a lot of results on that. But to be honest, um, let's talk about just the, just the vanilla option long here, a single, single long. Um, do I typically cut it quickly? I, what I do is, um, and you're saying too long. So a long could have been in profit. Let me pull up, uh, let me pull up Costco. I played here. My long could have been in profit and I could, um, I could have been here, right? With Costco. I could have been at 560 and been feeling real greedy, man. I could have been feeling real greedy, right? But at this point, I'm already in profit. So what I do, what you do to prevent this holding too long and or cutting too quickly is you move up your stop. Instead of thinking about what limit will I set for or will I sell for? What price do I want my contract to go to? If you're waiting for a contract to get to $500, but it's still at 350 but you're in profit already 25%. Move up your stop loss instead of setting a limit sell. That's not a loser's mentality. That is a guaranteed profiteering strategy. That is a profitable trading strategy. So do I typically cut too quickly? I, I'm sensitive to the red, but you're going to have that stop loss. When your trade goes green, don't let that that trade turn red. Move that stop loss. Um, guys, what I mean, let me spell this out because some of you are DMing me, so, telling me that this helps you. Stop loss. You originally set it at the amount you are willing to lose. For some traders, that is 50%. That is not acceptable to me. I am a 25%, 15% or 10% girl, depending on that trade. Okay? So I set that there, and I set it, and I forget it. I will eat stops all day for breakfast. I don't care. When my trade goes in profit, the stop loss moved to break even. Okay? That means that the least I can do is to have tried my trade but not lost anything. The way you win as a trader is having stop losses in profit. That way you're either winning or you're winning. <laughs> okay? But these are your first steps. You've got to enter the trade with the amount you're willing to lose. Set your stop loss there. Um, setting it a little bit outside of structure will give you a little leeway. Then move that to break even so your green trade doesn't turn red. Then green or green, baby. Helpful? Hope so. Okay. Um, big fan, I went into that a lot and we can get into that more, but I would encourage you to search the server because we have, um, time Hawks, another one I'd look at. I also look at big T, um, Garov, do I play leaps? Uh, 
yes, but I'm going to leave that for another day because that could be a lesson on its own. Please forgive me for not going into that one. I had a few more tickers I wanted to look at. Um, John, thanks for picking up the slack on some questions. Appreciate it. Uh, Ted Stoner, that was my stop loss strategy for, um, do I average? Uh, okay. Um, actually, so big fan, what you're talking about is doing a repair and rolling it down. I'm actually going to give you a little mo bit more to your answer because of Ted's, this covers it too. There's a phrase called kicking a can down a road. It means delaying the inevitable. If I'm already going to take a loss, I'm not going to bury more money into that just so I can sell for a bit of a smaller loss. Averaging down is a bad habit to be in. How do you prevent yourself from getting in a place where you're averaging down? By layering and scaling in your entries. We talk about this all the time on the podcast. JTW is good at this. If you want some mentorship on how to do this, um, please reach out to Byron or Birkenstock who can arrange for you to have have a session with a mentor. I'm one of those mentors. If you're interested, we can um, get you started on how to uh, customize your stop loss strategy. Um, yes, doing trailing stops can help. What you want to do is make sure that if you're starting a plan of having in scaled entries that you aren't setting too tight of a trailing stop. You know what I mean? Because maybe your 10% loss point might be your average down entering thing. So this really all depends on your trade plan. So to help answer your questions most, uh, please um, talk to Byron or Birkenstock for mentorship. Uh, BV adding Fubo to the list. Thanks again for the deadbeat dad candle, BV. I'm going to love that forever. Um... Thank you so much. My mother will be proud of how you pronounce my name. <laughs> Yay, I feel so happy to hear that. Uh, big fan, first loss is the best loss. Who says that, bro? <laughs> All losses are so, but that, I, that just hits hard. Hits different. Okay, VBIV. Let me get back on track. We are going on an hour and a half of this. I'm not done yet. I'm happy to give you, um, give you guys some mentoring here. I'm going to call it a night regardless, though, at nine, though. But I hope you... I feel like you're getting your money's worth with our membership. So VBIV, let's look at that primary trend. What did I say for the primary trend? It's one year. Today's date is December 2nd, 2021. So let's look at December 2nd of 2020. Where's December 2nd? That's around this point right here. So we're looking at this chunk of this stock. Let's look at our three months. Let's go to September 1st or 2nd. Looking at this chunk. Okay, so let's look with our primary trend here for one year. You can look at this as a high, a lower high, a lower high, a lower high. It, whether or not you include that, the primary trend for the last year is we're making lower highs. Now let's look at our lows. We've got some scattered differences here. We made lower lows, then we made some higher lows. But what we see in common is this support zone. Remember from our support and resistance lesson, we learned that there are sometimes zones instead of, of specific um, specific lines, one even number all of the time. These are also demand zones. Okay. We also see here that we have a supply zone. So let's get back to using some of that terminology and some of that structure here with VBIV. So in our primary and our secondary trend, our primary trend is, remember, if we aren't sure where we start here, we can look at price comparison. Where we really truly started for December 2nd, price was, let's go closer so I can show you this. I know you're watching my stream too and it's not as big, so please tell me if I get too uh, zoomed out on that. want to make it the best for you I can. Price open. This is why reading candles is important as well. Okay. So my candles, guys, I know um, people comment to me on the blue. I do that so that I can read the bodies and the trends rather than focus on the red or the green. But my light blue are my bullish and my darker blue are my bearish. So this would be my green. And this would be my red. So on that December 2nd date, we had a, we had a bearish candle. Price opened at 356 and closed down here at 316. Okay, so 356 to 316. Where was it at today? We had another bearish candle. Price opened at three dollars and closed to 271. So when you see all this mumbo jumbo, all this junk, just compare the prices. It's gone down. It's gone down. You can also see that being reinforced by some of these trends here. Where is price currently trading in the secondary trend? We also see price has spent more time going down than up. 
you can look at your beginning and you see that it's pretty much been a little bit of a consolidation period, right? It hasn't changed too much here. It's lingering around this demand zone. Remember our third time's the charm? We've got visit numero uno, which was just a wick, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> just the tip doesn't really count, guys. You got to go all in. One, <laughs> two, three. So what are we seeing with VBIV? We, first of all, we see a range, right? Second of all, we see um, a solid trend that's going on each other. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate that. Um, so we see a solid trend. We want to trade the range. We don't want to be trading the middle of the range here. So you had some people who came up here, though, and you want to look for other factors. We want to look at volume. On VBIV, yes, it was in demand zone. Yes, it's in demand zone here, but people just got done from a huge sell-off. Remember how I told you that's one of our red flags here? Look at this volume profile. What you want to see is even, some peaks, some valleys, not some big red flags, pump and dump, trash. So when we aren't sure about our technicals, if we want to have a second look at something, remember we talked about our FinViz screener, BBIV. Let's look at our dates on our charts and see what was happening this week in regards to VBIV. Well, first of all, we obviously have the COVID news, vaccine news, but when we come down here, we can look for December 1st or 2nd. Look, VBI vaccines to present new overall survival data from phase two study and blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Boring. VBI effects, FDA approval of a new vaccine. There we go. So that FDA approval meant that people, that's what caused this price to jump up in the morning. There was rumors of FDA approval. People buy the rumor and sell the news. People buy the rumor and sell the news. When you see these catalysts and you see these red flags, that means there was a there was something there likely fundamental. It was something on Twitter. Somebody tweeted. It was a merger and acquisition. It was a pump and dump. It was a vaccine approval. It was the opportunity to catch a leg on momentum but people buy the rumor and sell the news where do they sell the news at the nearest resistance in this case we have a resistance zone we have a nice supply zone do you see this area right here and this area right here okay that um price was not going to go towards people also have uh some round numbers here three dollars three twenty five three fifty ish range all right. So these tickers, they don't have enough volume to have the price to go up here, even with the momentum of the FDA news. So we had some selling. So what do we think for VBIV? Am I bullish or am I bearish? I'm bearish on VBIV, despite the fact that it's in demand zone, because the um, it showed that it didn't have any any strength here to break through when it had the momentum and the chance to. It has performance issues. VBIV has performance issues. But let's look at this from some other chart pattern perspectives. Oh, I forgot to be posting some of these charts, y'all. My bad. Swing Jam, appreciate the good vibes. Thank you so much. If I take all of this away. Hi, Stefan. How are you?
you know, what am I, uh, why am I entering a trade? What am I willing to lose? How much can I make curiously? So that now, what am I willing to lose at the current point of where price is up at the 25% is now where I would put my stop loss in profit, right? Because the whole reason why we wouldn't just take full profits at the top is because we believe with the curiosity that we can go higher, correct? But we still have to, in that new moment in time, make the decision that if I were to enter a long nap, because I do think it could go higher, where would my stop be, you know, by definition to keep it, you know, as fundamentally as possible. Um, so that was the first thing. I hope that, you know, might clear that up with where you'd want to put your stop, right? Because if you're just putting your stop at a point just based off of, you know, a percentage, that isn't a terrible strategy. And I don't think it's wrong strategy, especially if your mentality is a protection mindset. But if you put your stops at the validation points by doing that, then now it's based more off of, of whatever that point hits, it's very likely that now your trend and trade idea is pretty much invalidated. So now there's really no purpose of staying in. Um, so it's just basing it off of that. And then um, second, and then another thing that I wanted to bring up was when we talk about these trend concepts, when we talk about the minor, secondary, and primary, and the time slots that they do, the primary is just like on, on an aspect is a year. But guess what? The primary starts as soon as you get past the three month point. And then the primary can go all the way up to 10 years. Like, there is no limit on the primary trend. It's just a trend that's over a three month time period or longer. And it's the primary trend for the market. Okay? So, one year is the standardized concept of, of it as like a template. But that does not mean that that is going to be. Because. Like, this three levels that we've discussed and shared is basically the fundamentals of it, and you can get more in-depth, right? So, like, you can break it down into six levels. So, what I mean is, is the primary trend could have three levels of primary trend, in a way. You know, because you could have one year of downtrend, and it could be a primary trend, whereas the 10-year and the 20-year is, you know, uptrend. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind as well. Um, so, like, for instance, on the minor trend, secondary trend, the three-month, it doesn't have to be exactly three months you know it could be 75 days it could be 120 days so you know it's just a template so don't just say okay it's 90 days oh i'm buying right now and you know based off of a trend idea you know ironically it is a lot of times pretty close to those dates which is you know fantastic and which and this theory is like a 1920s theory by the way um, <laughs> which is ironic that it still you know correlates today it just shows that the market respects fundamentals so, you know, in that, in that aspect, and then, um, you know, the last thing that I wanted to mention is, is whenever we are looking at, um, you know, potential buys on, you know, big drops, you know, we talked about in the first lesson, the time to implement a lot of margin and to potentially implement more risk or exposure than ever would be at times of yearly, quarterly, multi-year supports. So, if you can look at any chart uh, that you like, and you can identify that what you are buying is technically, if you were to flip the chart and say, a, a new all-time low, for instance, like, a, like, for instance, looking at Hood right here that she's showing, I mean, you can see that this, you know, this is only showing, I mean, I don't know, I felt, I mean, am I wrong with saying, so Hood's only been on the, on the traditional market since August? Wow, I'm actually, I didn't even know that. But anyways, so this is a perfect example. So, it's showing that now that we're achieving to the upside, so guess what we are doing right now? What, are, what do you call this? You call this price discovery range. So this is price discovery. So in price discovery, by in, in inevitability, it's like almost like it doesn't. It's not when it's going to happen. It's I mean, it's not um, if it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. Is the fact is, is there's going to be a potential buy on hood here, a nice clean one, and the trend is going to be reversal. And it's just because, just based off probability, when these reversals occur when these price discovery aspects occur, it's the, uh, uh, whenever a foundation is secured, the origin of the, the low that we have now achieved, like all the way back in August on this one, it is very likely that we retest that once there is a reversal. So, like for instance, on Hood is a perfect example, so what you want to do is, is to, um, you know, because with any trade you want to start as a scout, right? Um, and you can do, there's a lot of tips and tricks to figure out, you know, a good area to buy taking a reversal point at the very, very top point of its highest price point, um, if you're looking more locally, 
um, what, I, what I would recommend is, is, is look for some sort of local achievement. So with, with stocks, I think it's better to look uh, on like a weekly time frame um, uh, rather than like a daily because achievement on the daily doesn't really mean too much. But if you look on the weekly and you look at like what's the high that created the low, when you look at, you know, what's happening, um, you know, currently at the moment. So like, like looking at uh, right here at Amy Sharp, we can see that, you know, for the most part, the $40, $39 range was the range where you could say the demand zone that created this move down, right? So, or, or even, hold on, I'm sorry, I, I was just eyeballing a different chart, but it's like between 40 and let's say $33, right? So um, that is the demand range, right? And guess where that demand range is? It was at the origin that created the point of failure that now, so that is the key, what I, what I like to call that is, is the point of interest, the point of control of this market. So whenever the reversal occurs, you can expect the probability of a retest of that range to be very likely. And if we break that, and then now we use it as a support rather than resistance, then guess what? Now we are entering a potential, you know, primary trend setup because now we're moving in basically set up for making new highs. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, a very interesting market. I think this market particularly has a lot of potential coming into the future. Um, you know, because I trade things based off of price action. Price action to me means more than fundamentals. When, you know, I've mentioned to some people, and I love the perspective of a lot of the experienced uh, traders here at, um, you know, X-Trades. They have this mindset of, um, uh, you know, hood is, you know, kind of trash. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, we don't, no one likes hood and who's the real deal uh, stock trader. And, like, to me, you know, that doesn't, ex uh, you know, change my opinion on anything at all. I'm just looking at pure buying and selling, right? And, you know, the, uh, it, the, the thing is, is at some point, you know, it, do you think that hood will go down to zero? Like, unless you think that there's a potential reasoning for the market to go belly up, which I don't think. And one of the biggest, um, I, now, this is the one thing I will say on a fundamental strength of what I think about hood is, is if you think about it on, on a phone app aspect, you know, the phone apps, if you, we see it in cryptocurrency right now, it, it isn't about the amount of money, it's the amount of user base. And the fact is, is you can get, you're getting such a larger amount of the user base and, you know, users that are getting their first influence into the market and think about this, if I don't know anything about the markets really, like obviously, you know, maybe it's somebody who knows nothing, right? Let's just think of the hypothetical. I know nothing about the markets. Oh, I probably know what Walmart is. You know, I'm starting to look things up. Well, one thing that I'd probably maybe be interested in getting is, you know, the apps uh, market that I'm trading the app on. You know, Robinhood's one of the top, you know, trading apps when it comes to the newbies, right? So, you know, the thing is, 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 is I just definitely think that in the long term, phone apps for the most part is, is just a my opinion, um, something that would be a good point to look at long term reversals. Um, but yeah, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the hood here, if I'm just looking at it from an eyeball perspective, if you just look at, um, um, you know, the next week or two, you kind of see, um, like, let's say this week right here, this mother candle establishment, look to see what happens in this, this next weekly close. Because if we start to see holdings like we saw at between 33 and 40, where you have this demand zone, right? So we want to see a week, two weeks, maybe even a third week of retest where it's saying, we're not going down anymore. Then that's your big buy signal when it comes to, you know, um, potentially taking even an option. Um, you know, uh, work, as of right now, I would recommend the, 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 the trade to take is just spot, buy, scale in. And like that's what I'm doing personally. I'm scaling in 25 all the way down to 20. So that's what I've been doing myself. And then whenever I get a, a confirmed confirmation of some sort of you know breakout achievement on the weekly, I might even take a few option longs. You know, um, you know I don't. I, I, I haven't personally taken too many weekly um, scalps. And I think honestly, if I started doing that personally as my own trader, I'd probably see some pretty serious success in the aspect. You know, I I, I for the most part with in, in um, stocks. You can get, uh, you know, uh, it can get kind of boring in the aspect that you know, in a couple of the bigger ones that only go up and there's not a lot of volume. This week has been fantastic. This week for me, I'm looking at all these tickers and I'm like, this is awesome. I'm starting to see some liquid, some movement. I'm starting to see some downside movement. You know, I really, I, I really enjoy it. So you know, I, uh, you know, 
this is a really interesting time in stocks because for the most part, if you think about it, if you scroll out to like a multi-year standpoint on some of these huge tickers, they mostly in primary trends are going up, right? So then by definition, if we want to get some nice spot buys for the next year, what are we looking for? Monthly, quarterly, yearly supports. So resistance turns support. Now looking at Twitter here is a perfect example. Does that fit that definition? Are we starting to enter monthly, quarterly, yearly support range? You know, so you know, that's something to think about, guys. Because if you if you think about it in that aspect, it, you, you won't have fear, right? Because you're entering based on fundamentals. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have any validation. It doesn't mean that you don't have like when I'm buying spot on things, I have massive scale in range. Like you know what I mean? What I what I say is like let's say I had a thousand dollars. Um, then what I would do is I would do four six percent scaled in entries. So I would do you know that how much would that be? That'd only be twenty five percent of a thousand, so two fifty. Now my point is is by doing that, then whenever there's a reversal, if I want to do the most, then now the risk to reward is much greater, and that's going to continue to the wave once the reversal has occurred. But if I'm scaling in, I'm buying the bloods, I'm trying to catch a falling knife. You know, just do small scale in entries. You know, it, be very patient because what that's the thing with stocks. Is for the most part, you can just you're playing the long term. You're not playing this, unless you're doing options or some sort of leveraged aspect. You're playing the long term on it. So you know you need to you know think of it. You don't need to be you know, so rushed about it, and you got to be very patient about your entries. And we talked about it, you know, in the, the first lesson. Um, you know, you want to only take two to three trades. Um, you know, in a, in a, in a, a two quarter in a six month aspect. You know, so like if we as an example, we looked at Twitter. Let's look since 2020. How many trades did you, could you have really have taken? With, um, you know, maybe I see one, two, or three, or four in the last year and a half. You know, there was you know a sh maybe two short opportunities that were halfway decent, and then maybe two long opportunities coming into the third long now. When it comes to spot plays, right, or spot shorts or spot longs. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the you know the the lower risk um, aspects. But all right, now I need to take a breath. <laughs> No, Stefan, you're my knight in shining armor because I thought I could keep going, and then when I, as soon as I stopped to breathe, I'm like, oh my god, two hours. Okay, so um, here's where my man John G comes in clutch. Left on the uh, on the docket, we've got DraftKings, Fubo, CLSK, Roblox, and Neo. Um, so John, thank you for posting the Roblox chart. Uh, we just went through Hood. We finished up uh, Twitter here. With Twitter, again, um, I agree with Stefan's commentary on that. You're coming into some good buy ranges. When Remember that the dump this week was Jack Dorsey, who's selling his shares. He's leaving, stepping down as CEO. And then Twitter has also announced one of the youngest CEOs um, in the game. And so there's some uncertainty there from that fundamental aspect that you can capitalize on if you understand price action. You can watch for those reversals, watch for supports to hold, all of those good things. But still, look at this selling level. Wait for there to be a confirmed change in the price action to where people are buying so that you don't catch those falling knives but how do you do how do you um, plan for those entries scaled entries so twitter is um in the long run we've got lots of good examples for that yes agreed Sol stefan with the solid advice Next, we've got a little DraftKing action. Um, John, thank you for Neo. If you want to work on CLSK, for those friends who don't know, um, John G is an uh, a moderator. He's on Team X Trades and Team Crypto Traders. He's been um, beefing up his trading levels. Very proud of John for being a full-time student and um, you know full-time off-topic DGen troll as well as no, just kidding, uh, but a lifetime Elite Plus member at x trades and just really passionate about giving back to the community really improving the technical skills and all that stuff here so really love to see it thank you for your opinions and help tonight john uh with DraftKings, um let's see what we got working on here i'll call this one my last one for the night hope you all found this session helpful okay so we want to look at december second ish range of last year and again, it doesn't have to be the exact date, but this is where we're looking at. This is our zone right here. We can look at smaller time frames. We can look on the weekly or we can look on the monthly. 
to help see those candles. But what you see here with DraftKings is regardless of which time frame you look at, you have a clear top pattern. This is uh, in the high time frame, it's like a rounded top. In the smaller time frame, you've got that triple top action. You couldn't beat this high price couldn't swing so then where is it going to go it wants to find the next support levels where could the next support levels be on a weekly standpoint with DraftKings you have a few different places where you would have liked to see price held hold originally is here for a chance at, at continuation to the upside because that means there was some demand in this range with these candles right here back in November December range but it didn't it didn't want to swing here that would have been this range right here Instead, when it lost this range right here, again, there's that 50% of that candle that we've been talking about, and it came back down here, we're looking for price to find a bottom before we see some reversal. To keep it simple, you just want to ask yourself, is a stock going up or down? Is a stock having more buying or having more selling? Over here from September, you can see about this range. It's a small time frame trend. Is this stock going up or is this stock going down? Right here you can see there was a pretty clean downtrend here. Once price came over here and failed to swing these highs and break into this um, tested supply range up here at the top, this would have been some good uh, layered entries for a short. And then where do we think bottom can be? I don't know with DraftKings. I always like to have hope for March Madness um, on a fundamental play. I remember saying that last year as well, and it didn't really uh, come out for me. So one thing to do when you're feeling um, uncertain or if you're like, hey, where could a bottom be? You can look at some past history of the price, which is always going to give you the most unbiased thing uh, when it comes there. But otherwise, you can look into some I love that it wants to correct it. Uh, you can look at some other perspectives fundamentally. What are institutions rating this price value at? Where do they see price going? Remember, institutions, they have to pay. There's this holding here, 60 above 60%. So this is a um, partially manipulated stock, but it also means that it has the volume, right? But my three criteria here for institutional ownership and met volume is met, but it's not meeting the performance year to date. So how much worse can it get? It's trading severely below its moving averages. We see some um, bad sides over here on the daily and on the weekly chart, but what you want to see is price to find a bottom, and I think that you could start to see some reversals here with the lowest point being around 26.62 but when we're at these price levels where we haven't broken a hundred yet remember from our support and resistance lesson as well is that you'll have round numbers being spots where price will always want to find uh, a floor right so you got like a $20 ish range 22.50 $25 whatever the case may be that's where you can find some value here if the lowest we would go I would say might be here but what you want to see is that if in order for this to remain a growth stock is to be trending up over time you also have this to look at as well so what you want to see is buying overpowering selling confirmed reversal in price thank you so much for the <laughs> it's not a kind of oof chart clsk so that's DraftKings for me i'm tapped out we got four minutes left I'm not going to do any more uh, charting, but I'll let you guys ask me anything you want to know in the discussion channel before I finish up the recording here. Actually, I'm going to end the recording.